Genesis 31, reading verses 22 to 55. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead when Laban overtook him, and Laban and his relatives camped there too. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You've deceived me, and you've carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could send you away with joy and singing and the music of timbrels and harps? You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night the God of your father said to me, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you long to return to your father's household, but why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered Laban, I was afraid because I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force. But if you find anyone who has your gods, that person shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourself whether there is anything of yours here with me, and if so, take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he found nothing. After he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them inside her camel's saddle and was sitting on them. Laban searched through everything in the tent but found nothing. Rachel said to her father, Do not be angry, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. I am in the manner of women. So he searched, but could not find the household gods. Jacob was angry and took Laban to task. What is my crime? He asked Laban. How have I wronged you that you hunt me down? Now that you have searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine, and let them judge between the two of us. I have been with you for twenty years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself, and you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime, and the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years and for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away and be handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. <laughs> Laban answered Jacob, The women are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine. Yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine, or about the children they have born? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I. Let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. He said to his relatives, gather some stones. So they took stones and piled them in a heap, and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Jegar Sahadutha, and Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why it is called Galid. It was also called Mizpah, because he said, May the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters, or if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. Laban also said to Jacob, Here is this heap, and here is this pillar I have 
Christ set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you, and that you will not go past this heap and pillar to my side to harm me. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac. He offered a sacrifice there in the hill country and invited his relatives to a meal. After they had eaten, they spent the night there. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then he left and returned home. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. As we get ready for prayer today, is there anything you want to make mention of this morning? Loretta, go ahead there. The Chris Bayshore family, they live out across from Shannon Hitchcock there. Chris passed away the day before and was.
your first disciples, how they came to you, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. In 2020, we still want to know how to pray and come back to words like these that were taught to us so long ago. We join our voices together as we remember our Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. somebody. God loves you. God loves you out there on Facebook this morning. We uh, are in Galatians chapter 4 right now. Right in the heart of Galatians 4 uh, verses 8 to 20 today. Uh, the thing that hit me after I uh, read through here was, I don't know, I don't know why, the, the phrase sick and tired jumped off the page at me as I read through here today. And, uh, Paul has had to deal with issues like this uh, and many a times as he's preached the gospel. And it's always about explaining uh, people to people what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to leave things behind. And uh, here's a little bit more explaining here today. Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 to 20. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces. Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was not a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Jesus, or Christ Jesus himself. Where, then, is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? These people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us, so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. The whole idea of being sick and tired. Have you ever had to explain something over and over and over again? Any parents here today who have had to explain things to their children again and again and again? They still don't get it. We were all there. Some of us are still there. Sometimes there's just no explaining a thing to somebody. Paul has seen his Galatian audience come to a point of accepting Christ and then falling back into false teachings about following Christ, about what it means to follow God. He's had a strong Jewish audience that has preached about keeping the law. And it has come down to this place here, or about 
observing special days and months and seasons of the year and things like that. Uh, he's also preaching to an audience in each one of these cities where he writes these letters. He's preaching to an audience that has to deal with that Greek background of worshiping gods, uh, Zeus, Athena, things like that. And there's lots of festivals and things that would go on with worshiping those gods. You have to leave those things behind and come follow Christ in faith. And in this world we live in, it is hard to leave things behind and just follow God, uh, to walk with Him. Many of you understand that because you've grown up right here. You've grown up right here in this place. You've been here all of your lives. And people know who you are before you knew Jesus. And maybe you remember what you were like before Jesus came into the picture. And we have to leave things behind and follow along with Christ. And it's not always easy. And it goes to the point where he says, I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you in verse 11. He pleads with them. He pleads with those around us to preach this message. Uh, sometimes we plead and we beg. Uh, never forget what it was like being a teenager. <laughs> Very much in touch with my teenage years and all telling stories on myself today. I uh, had the, the ability to drive, got my license, got my car, got all that time to myself, and here came spring break in my senior year when I finally had my car and my license and the ability to drive, and I stayed out every night of spring break until about 4.30 in the morning. Oh man, by the end of that week, my dad was steaming. Should have been home way, 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 way before that. I remember my dad, who has begged and pleaded with me. I remember him coming in to the living room and just sitting down in the chair across from me. And, okay, here's what we're going to do. And we set up some boundaries and some things that we were going to follow. And we nodded and agreed to it. And, okay. Parents, we beg and we plead, want our children to follow us and to listen to us. Uh, Paul here in verses 12 to 16 is remembering some good times, some good things between him and the Galatians. And then they fell back into some of these other outside influences. And he's like, what have you, what has happened here? Verse 16, he says, Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Uh, we talk about truth, but is, is truth what we really want in this world, or is it just us getting our way? Is that what we want? We really want to hear the truth? So the truth isn't always easy to hear. The truth isn't always uh, kind to us, but it's the truth. He's preached the truth about Jesus. He's preached the truth about our sins, about repenting, about leaving things behind, about walking in faith. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? He talks about these people, these outside influences, uh, trying to win them over in verse 17. These people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. Uh, the idea of these outside forces being referred to as gods really brings the story around to what we just read from uh, Genesis uh, this morning as Laban pursues uh, Jacob into the hills and follows him. And, and what is he after? talks about his daughters and his grandchildren and things like that, but what is he going tent to tent for looking? Those gods, those, those idols, those statues, those is very important to him. That's what he's really after. A 
put all my faith and all my trust in this gold or wooden or stone statue and expect this God to bless our families. Why did Rachel take him with her? I don't have any idea why she would do that. Maybe they were important to her. Maybe there was something about her past tied into those statues and she wants to take them along with her uh, to be part of her life in the future. Uh, but there, there is a breaking apart from our past that needs to happen. We need to walk forward into this life with God and it doesn't look like she's doing that in that moment. And uh, Laban doesn't seem to have learned anything in this moment either uh, here about of the Lord and following the God of Jacob's ancestors, uh, one true living God. And uh, these false gods are wrapped up in the whole story uh, here. And Paul is talking to his audience here in Galatia. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Uh, any number of things in our world, whether, whether it is gold and stone and metal statues or whether it's our own inhibitions that we get attached to leading us and guiding us. Uh, there are so many things in this world that become idols to us that we can't live without. We put up there on that pedestal and say that's the center of my world. Many of those things have nothing to do with the Almighty God. But now that you know God or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Leaving it all behind. Walking forward with Jesus. He says in verse 17, these people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. Why is it what they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. As soon as you hear the word zealous, you can't help but go back to Jesus flipping over tables in the temple. And turn that outer court area at the temple into a marketplace which is where the Gentiles were supposed to come and worship God. It was it's part of the temple complex. It's a worship area, but they had turned it into a market so that the Jewish people who are going to worship God and bring their sacrifice up, they have to come through here and buy their animals and take them forward into the temple for sacrifice. Uh, we're not really thinking about anybody else around us in this moment turning all this temple court area into what we want it to be. What does it mean to be zealous? There were some people there that day were pretty zealous about making a dollar, you know. And they preferred the whole idea of what the temple was all about. And Jesus comes through. In this time where rioting and looting and destroying things has been part of our American makeup this year. What are we zealous about? What are we really doing here? You know, what are we zealous for, and what is the purpose behind what we are doing? Paul says it is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. Dad used to say that all the time to us. You, know, you, should, you should act as if I'm standing right there. Whatever you're doing and saying, wherever you're going through in that moment, you should act as if I'm standing right there, right there beside of you. Have that image stuck in your head, you know, for the rest of your life that he's, he's right, right there, you know, right there beside of me. Dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Uh, Paul would say in other places that he would write very 
boldly in his letters, but when he was with them in person, he would tend to be very meek and very quiet in person. He would write very strongly in his letters. And sometimes you got to act like the lion in order to be the lamb that you really are. Comedian Dave Chappelle said his mother would say that to him. As he was growing up, sometimes you gotta act like the lion in order to be the lamb that you really are. Paul would preach boldly and strongly so that when he came to them in person, he could be the meek person that he was. I said it to you when I started you know, nine years ago now. It's easier to be tough and rough in the beginning and then ease up as you go along. That was the thought of Pat Summit, the former Tennessee basketball coach. She would be very tough and you see all those ESPN films of her out there. She doesn't hold anything back on her girls and they would start the season very rough and tough, you know. And in her career, in her time of coaching, she would be very rough and tough and very... And it's easier to do that in the beginning and then ease up as you go along than it is to come in all fluff and puff and then try to be tough later on because your people have already gotten used to this. They don't want to hear tough back down the road. Be tough now. Paul would be tough with this audience from the beginning the start. Sometimes we have to be that way with our kids. Sometimes we have to be that way in our world. Sometimes you got to act like the lion in order to be the lamb that you really are. Go forth and preach the message of Jesus. Let it fall where it will. And love everybody around you. That's the, that's the hard part to bring those two ideas together. How do I stand firm for my beliefs and my morals and yet love everybody around me who doesn't agree with those viewpoints? How do I bring those two ideas together in here? And it can be done. Stand firm for what you believe. Love everybody around you. Let that come together. Maybe the Lord could lead us and guide us. Wall. It's a good, good idea we came up with here to just have one hymn that we can sing all the way through and kind of course it through the whole service. We've been singing about the Savior leading us, guiding us. Let's sing one last verse of that today. Why don't you stand with me?
just let everybody go at the end of the service. I don't know who else I asked Brady today if you the guy to let me go at the end of the service when he handled it. After we're done with the announcements here, so. I don't know. Um, I just saw on Facebook the chat show us that lost his father last yeah. night. Oh. Yeah. So just keep okay. Chad and their family in our prayers. Wow. Um, and in the praise category, Dave and Connie Hester celebrating a 51st anniversary today. Aww. So if you see her on Facebook, send her a little message and wish her, wish her well. Um, we have a PPR meeting Tuesday evening at 7.30. Um, Bible study still Thursday at 6.30. We have our dinner coming up Saturday. Everything good? We need green beans. Yeah, we need green still need green beans. Yeah.
request, I would keep forgetting, and then a prayer request of Richard, who would come and sit behind Don and come to the dinner. Uh, his grandson, I ran to a week before last, and I keep forgetting to mention it. He apparently had a really bad fall. Sounds like it was in the house. Many, many broken bones. Uh, Malachi was telling me many, many, many stitches. So he's having a really hard time. So I think we need to remember Richard being here. Sweet guy. Sweet, sweet guy. Remember Richard in your prayers. I have forgetting too. I know. It's okay. Thank you so much. Anything else? If you got to know Richard at all, he's kind of quirky. You know, yes. <laughs> who never put his offering in the offering plate, would always leave it in the, on the mailbox on the door, or he'd leave it outside my door in the house, and stuff like that. I never could get an address and a phone number out of him, so if anybody has an address or a phone number for him, um, I would love that. Okay. Yeah. If I think about it, I'll ask Malachi the next time I see him. Okay. At least we can send him some cards or something. Yeah. yeah. We know his brother, so we're good. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Just real quick, as far as the prayers go, uh, I'm pretty sure many of you that are here from antibodies from down the jolly way. She has an unspoken. Uh, and I have two family unspoken. So just thank you for your prayers. Keep lifting each other up. God is good and keep the strength of children. So we just need to love one another. From afar.
we get your cards to go with them. Okay, yeah, they're down there in the back. Okay, so I got a red, white, and blue. Oh, I'm going to say. sister of, you know, family, I pretty much was like their adopted daughter, <laughs> and uh, she had posted something on Facebook that you can't be a Democrat and be born a good Christian, and it broke my heart. I'm like, why are we letting politics determine who we are as children of God? Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I remember you. I remember you are. Something. I, I broke my and, and put, so many people put me out the room and they go, we felt so bad, we just had to like leave you there, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, because sometimes it's there to let you. Get and I said, no, I, I said, I needed to just get it out because it was like eating at me. Yeah. Because it was just eating. But I agree. Politics should never play part in that. And also children, when you told mom, because I'm, you know, a exactly. teacher with the kids, it's like these kids don't ask for all this in the phone or ask for it's like, why are we doing what we're doing? I mean, exactly. they, you know, and, yeah. and then we're putting them in the middle of all different, different things. Exactly. No. They want them. Yeah, so, me too. Me yeah. too. So, I, 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 Loretta spoke to me. I just spoke to me. You spoke to me. Tammy and I are looking at each other going, were you crying? Yes, I was crying, but I cry all the time anyway. Yeah. Right. So, so, I'm I'm the, they put that on Facebook, right? Yeah, he posts that. Well, he posts that blog. It goes, it goes out live on Facebook and then oh, he posts it on YouTube. Yeah. What do you look up on Facebook? Uh, if you pull up Jeremy mm -hmm. and then add, you 